morning, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Good morning from Colorado. Where it might be spring today. Still working on this thing. I want to mention um, right at the top um, that web page that's at the top of this. Um, you should be able to see in turquoise. Rebecca has uh, changed the shed. I have put. Um, information about links and stuff that we were talking about there. So I might just say someone's looking for materials or something. I might just say, hey, look on the website. That's what I mean. Um, someone asked about the Hepti spindle yesterday. So there's information there about that. So if you're looking for something we talked about and you need a link, check it out. Let's see, I'm using this little knitting needle as a uh, open shed rod. That actually wish it was a little bit fatter because I'm having trouble. That's the wrong shed anyway. Having trouble finding it. Everybody from all over the place. Everywhere from the Canadian West Coast to Texas to Brooklyn um, to Portugal. <laughs> That's so sweet, Mandy. She said, um, days are not the same without the sessions. Almost don't want lockdown to end. I, I hate to say that myself, Mandy. Um, Colorado is putting together plans now for opening stuff up so we'll see how that goes I don't think things are going to be back to whatever we used to think was normal anytime soon um, Port Angeles Washington hi Sarah that's a beautiful place um, I love the Olympic. That's on the Olympic Peninsula, right? Beautiful place. Um, okay, still weaving a foot this morning. I meant to be done by today, but Alabama, Woodstock. Vicki's weaving on her Hoket loom. Awesome. I hope y'all are weaving something or at least keeping yourself busy in some way, even if it's a jigsaw puzzle. Um, California, Wisconsin, um, Maryland, Annapolis, <clears throat> California, Texas, California, SoCal, Green Bay, Wisconsin, yay, Florida, California, New York, London. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Mandy, so, <clears throat> oh, Michelle, let me answer this first. 
Sorry, I should talk more in the morning so you don't get my frog voice. Um, I should practice. I should warm up before um, showing up. Michelle asked, how do I get the chat to show when I visit, revisit one of the older um, videos? So you actually, um, I was playing with this last night. You actually have to play the video. So then there are a few videos that don't have chat. And I'll just tell you now, if you can't find it for one of the videos, that's probably why. But um, uh, if, most of them do have chat. And if you play the... Um, play the video and then there's a chat screen on my screen. It's to the bottom right side of the video player. And there's a choice for top. Um, there's two boxes. One says top, top chat or something. And the other says um, it's, it's, there's a box that you choose that will play the comments as the video plays. So I don't think you can scroll through the thing. If you scroll through the video, the chat will change. So as far as I know, that's how it works. Um, and then Mandy said that she loves the nail polish. So, yeah, um, I'll talk about the nail polish in a second. Um, yay, 12 years on my blog. That was yesterday. I've been writing my blog for 12 years. Um, doesn't seem like 12 years, but New Mexico. Donald likes the toenail color, too. Oh, thanks, you guys. Um, Michigan. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Ellen always gives me a good shot in the arm for um, giving myself enough credit for doing some work. Um, Washington. <laughs> Lisa, you guys have great opinions on the toenail polish. <laughs> if you saw yesterday's thing, the toenail polish was purple, so I took it out and um, anyway. Florida, Idaho, um, Maine. Hey, Linda from Maine. Linda's one of my favorite Maine weavers. She does wonderful things. Linda Whiting. Um, if you go to any uh, festivals in Maine, you might see her there selling her amazing yarn and everything else. Um, Denver. Hi, Elsie. Right down the road. Um, are they howling in Denver, Elsie? So there's this thing in Co in Fort Collins that at 8 o'clock, everybody goes outside and howls. And for weeks, I was like, why are the coyotes howling at 8 o'clock at night? Turns out it's not coyotes, it's my neighbors. Um, and the dogs are joining in. So I don't know if they're doing that in Denver or anywhere else. But um, it's it's. Uh, I was on a video chat with friends last night at eight o'clock, and through their video audio, I could hear on their side of town people howling. Very odd. Maybe I should try it tonight. Actually, it might be fun. Um, yay! So I'm glad you all are here. And um, let me show you the toenails. <laughs> so um, yesterday the. <laughs> This toenail was uh, this color, if you recall, because I wanted to use the silk. And I was like, oh, yeah, shiny purple toenails. I don't paint my toenails. I don't have anything against painting my toenails. I'm just lazy. And why would I spend the time on that? But um, it looked like it looked like the foot had like a black and blue toe. So I went to this color, which I felt was much better. Uh, we'll see. Then there's one thing. Let's see if I can show you. I just did this. I did it before I went on the air because I wanted to make sure it wouldn't look horrible. Um, I wanted a differentiation between the light foot color and the toenail color, but I didn't want it to be black, black. Um, I didn't want it to be like this outline. So I was, I wanted to, I just grabbed a couple um, yarn colors and I chose, I wanted to use one of these two. I was going to use gray and then I saw this uh, brown ish taupe color which has some red in it so I chose that because I knew it would blend in but it gives it a little definition I don't know if it's better but I think it's better than not having it maybe the gray would have been better but I'm not going back now um oh Elsie says in Denver they shoot fireworks yeah I heard some fireworks uh through my friend's audio last night too 
How Nancy says we're howling in Denver and Conifer. So I guess I missed the memo somewhere about this howling thing, you guys. But um. oh, in Kansas also, apparently it's a national thing. Yeah, so I thought that the frontline workers thing was the seven o'clock, like clapping and cheering. We live in, you know, suburban Fort Collins, and I guess it's still a great way of supporting people. So we can we can howl. Um, yes, Lisa, that is the yarn I was testing the other day. So um, I don't think I maybe saw that email yet, but um, uh, just yarn is who is making that yarn I was testing the other day, which um, I might bring that loom back later this week so you can see, bring it back. Um, Okay, so I'm going to do the easy part of this today, and then I'll try to weave up, and I'll show you some of the hard part, I promise, unless I get scared. Let's see, I'm going to add, this is how I'm adding new butterflies. This is only one strand of this Weaver's Bazaar, so I'm just doing this, cut a new piece. Put it in like that. I'm going to leave some little tails. I probably will not stitch those tails in when this set is so small that I think um, stitching in this yarn will um, distort it too much. So I will probably leave these tails on the back. I'll trim them and just let them. So I just stuck them through to the back like that. Um, So I'm just building up these shapes for this foot and then I'm going to, is this my open shed? Yes. So that's what the shed rod is for. Um, In Italy, they sing opera. Oh, Diane, that is wonderful. <laughs> we don't live in Italy. But I hope if any of you are opera singers, you're singing opera at 8 o'clock. Oh, Sheila, your real coyotes in Santa Fe probably are doing great. Oh, look at that. See, I can hardly see this. But I can tell that there is a, um, you all probably can't see this. I have made a, is that going to focus? I have made a double shot right here because I'm talking. See, look at that. Those two are in the same shed. And let's figure out how that happened right here where I said, oh, it's in the open shed. It wasn't. Um, there's a float right there in the top one. And so from this point on, I ended up in the wrong shed. Happy to have noticed that now and not later. You can fix a double shot like that. Um, I think maybe I made up the word double shot. Does anybody else, have you heard that anywhere else? I feel like now I've used it so long, maybe I made it up myself, but um, I apologize if I learned it from someone and I'm forgetting. Um, just means there's two webs in the same shed. They should be in separate sheds, and so you can actually fix it by separating that point and putting another piece of weft in the shed that you basically missed. So I could have done that. If I hadn't seen it, I could have gone back later and just in that little area, wove in with a needle the um, other shed. I'm, even with this tiny, tiny set, I'm getting a little bit of ridging right there. So... Um, Yes, Lisa, that was the yarn I was testing. So um, yeah, Gist Yarn, if you don't know Gist Yarn, G-I-S-T, um, Sarah Resnick is the owner of that business and it's a mail order business out of um, Boston. And um, she's really committed to selling yarns that are sourced from farmers um, and made in the United States. So 
for us weavers it's just really nice and it's weaving yarn um mostly it's yarn for um for um like shaft weaving but um she has some really beautiful yarns and um her biz i just love her business model that she's trying to support the um fiber industry in the united states so she is working on a new tapestry yarn, which I think is quite lovely. We'll see how that works out. But she also does the podcast. If you haven't heard the Weave podcast, um, tune in. She now has um, a woman whose name I'm going to forget. It's one of you will know what it is who does a lot of them and she's interviewing a lot of farmers and um, fiber farmers and stuff but um, she interviewed me on one of her early episodes she's interviewed Bhakti Zeke if you're in the um, design class you might have listened to that interview with Bhakti um, she has a lot of really interesting interviews and the podcast is just called I think it's just called Weave, but if you go to Gist Yarn, G I S T Yarn.com, you should be able to find there's a drop down that's for the podcast. Um, Monica's already asking what EPI would I recommend for the new Gist Yarn? So um, the uh, loom I was showing you that had that yarn. Let's see if I can show it to you without dropping everything. Um, this is that yarn. And this was at 10 ends per inch with three strands. And I felt like it was a little bit tight. Um, three strands at eight ends per inch, I think would work great. And maybe four. I haven't tested that, but um, it's a thin-ish singles. It's not super thin. It's um, quite a bit thicker than the Weaver's Bazaar. So it doesn't, it won't have quite the color blending possibilities of Weaver's Bazaar fine, but um, if you like sort of a medium sized yarn, it's sort of the size of the, um, of this yarn that I'm using here. The, this is the Kohler Singles, but um, made by Harrisville Designs, or the Faru yarn made by Bakken's. It's, it's similar to that in size. It's a little, it's a two ply, so it's a little bit different, but. Um, I believe McKenna that the answer is yes, that if she's mentioning a tapestry, well, that's what they're working on. So we're trying to get everybody excited about it. Um, yeah, Ruth, there was an email yesterday. Um, thanks, Ruth, from the British Tapestry Group, which I will try to find it and see if I can put it at that website that's above um, on my website. Um, the British Tapestry Group and the ATA are um, doing something with frontline weavers. Um, and I will admit that I did not read it very carefully last night, but I will look at it more because both of those groups are fabulous, the British Tapestry Group and the American Tapestry Alliance. And if you don't belong to either or both of them, check them out. Um, double shot sounds like a large drink. <laughs> Thanks, Betsy and Nancy. I think that's funny. Um, I Yeah, I think I probably made up that term um, a long time ago, and it just, in my head, turned out to be like a real thing, but it really isn't. Um, two Fs in the same shed. Double shot was my way of um, simplifying that phrase. Um, LaShawn, thank you, Barb. So... Um, just Yarn, Sarah Resnick is the owner of that business, and she has teamed up with LaShawn, who does most of the podcasts now, I think. And LaShawn is great. So if you want to listen to some fun weaving podcasts, um, go to Just Yarn, G-I-S-T-E-R-N.com. Um, or just look in your podcast thing. It will come right up. It's called Weave. Um Espresso drinks, double shot, yeah. 
I, I, yeah, I don't even drink coffee, so I don't know. Um, that Gist yarn is pretty similar to the Weaver's Bazaar Medium Barb. I haven't, um, I'll have to compare them more directly, but I think the Weaver's Bazaar Medium might be a tiny bit thinner, but um, I'll look at the yards per pound and stuff. Oh, is the audio not matching the... Um, there may be a lag in your audio. It could be, I don't know what it is, Jocelyn. I can't actually do anything about it, but um, it might be a lag in um, your internet or something. I'm guessing that the replay will be okay. So, Tuesday. I was talking to a friend last night and she said she's never she never really uses her Google Calendar, but now she uses it all the time because it reminds her, it sends her a notification of what day it is. So I feel like that's a worthy um, thing to keep track of these days. Okay, so someone yesterday was asking me what I do at the juncture of these things. And I said something about fudging. And then someone pointed out that it's probably not a great word to use. It's not fudging. It's just tapestry weaving. Um, it is the way it is. It's not that I'm fudging the edges of this. It's that I'm managing them effectively in a professional manner <laughs> or something. I'm doing a vertical... Um, here, let me get this out of the way and then I can show you. Right here I'm doing a, um, I need this line to go up vertically. This is the little, this little silly line that goes up to this butterfly. Of course it's turned this way. So it's super vertical right there. But because I have this split warp, I'm doing a little experiment here by splitting these two warps, I can make this vertical line without it being a one warp wrap, which gives it a little more tooth and keeps it from being quite so unstable. One of the things when I did the design here, yeah, I could use a um, bar join or something like that, like that. Someone's gonna ask that any second, but I made, this was a deliberate thing when I was doing this design was to make these lines short because I knew they would be vertical. Um, it goes with the design being that, you know, oh, maybe this butterfly is speeding up here. But um, if I make these short, I don't have to worry about the slits. So sometimes design dictated by structure. So I'll probably go maybe a little longer than that. Um, okay, good. Good to know that a bunch of you have audio that's keeping up. Um, I find, have any of you done more? Um, the internet is not performing to its optimum because, well, it probably is, but everybody's on the internet, especially at night. So have you noticed the, uh, if you're on like a Zoom or a FaceTime call or something, the lag, Zoom especially does this. Like the internet can't keep up and it'll just freeze for a second and then it will still tell you everything the other person said but there's a lag and then it like shoves it all in i don't think youtube does that but the uh recording should be accurate and if it isn't you should let me know because i have a backup recording i can always put up okay so Doing that. Let's see. That's probably long enough. So I'm going to come around here. How am I going to do that? I'm going to do a pigtail because I want it to be trapped between those two warps. This is something that Sarah Sweat actually taught me in um, the Fringeless class. That in Fringeless you have, um, which is a method of forced salvage warping, you have two warps together like this and that 
you can trap tails between them and kind of stabilize everything. So then that will stay there and not all unwrap on me as I'm weaving around it. Um, oh yeah, Marianne, there's a lot of reasons. That's a good question. Um, So Marianne's asking, why did I weave it this way? Is there a reason to weave it this way besides the size? And in this case, it had nothing to do with the size because it's square. I could have woven it either way. But when you're looking at a design and which way you're going to weave it, um, horizontal lines are much easier to weave smoothly in tapestry than vertical lines. And in this case, these lines were really important to me. I wanted them to be smooth. If I had to weave each of those little skinny lines, which are these, vertically, this piece would not have the same character at all. It was really important that these were smooth lines that um, were coming down. So weaving it this way was a no brainer. Also wanted the edges of this foot to be smooth. Um, that means that the edges here um, are not smooth, except that I chose to do this double set thing. And so the, the change in the yarn along this edge, um, again, design materials, all of those things go together. Um, covers up the stepped nature of that because of this fuzzy yarn sort of covering the edge and it um, doesn't seem like it's as um, stepped as it might otherwise be with this vertical line. This line, which I haven't come to yet, is um, one that I haven't decided about yet. That is the one thing that I would like that to be straight. Um, so I may just use a sewn slit there. That's probably what I will do. Um, anyway. That's a good question. Um, Eva has a good question. This is a um, Mirex. So there is, let's see if I can move this camera without making you sick. Okay, so here's the shedding bar on the Mirex. And she's asking how close can she weave to the shedding bar? Um, you can move the shedding bar up, first of all. So it can go all the way so that the handle goes around this very top corner. And, um, I don't like to weave too close. I probably wouldn't weave closer than about three inches to the shedding bar. Um, that's because it causes, um, your shed will get tighter and tighter and then it will start to cause ridging. It will cause things in the weaving, but um, I'm kind of picky about that. So there's a, you know, on this loom, there's probably a good 10 inches of warp that I would not use that because the warping bar can come all the way to the top of the loom but yeah there's a bunch of the warp that I wouldn't use um, oh Monica I love Monica's 92 year old aunt has a days of the week clock I really these days I could use it Angie's um, saying that this seems like a good trick and would that um, doubling the warp all the time be a good idea? And I don't really know, Angie. Um, maybe. I think that um, if there's nothing wrong with using a doubled warp in the rest of the piece, um, I'd have to think about that you use a lot more warp obviously of the thin warp but that's not necessarily a problem and of course just weaving over it it doesn't look any different so maybe oh see i just messed up my the other thing we talked about a long time ago was that i was doing um cutbacks or lazy lines here which you probably they're a little bit hard to see but there's one going through there so this was supposed to come to here Talk about keeping everything in mind. And are these, those are in the same shed. So I also just popped this little thing in there without really worrying about the shedding being off. It doesn't really matter for that one little thing. You'll never notice. So now I wanna weave over the top here. See if I like that line. 
I have worked myself into a corner here because this is supposed to go to here and this butterfly doesn't have much room. Ah, also, one more thing. You can't probably see through my hands. Right here, you can see that this warp is hanging out there, that this little heel moved over. So I needed to wrap that, put that, um, so that the edge of the heel starts to curve back. And then I can go over. I'm not sure that that would what I just did there would always work with every yarn. I have, but just by splitting that warp in half, I've create put a little bit of extra weft in that area. It seems to be working okay. This is a fairly squishy yarn, um, so I think it works all right. But um, yeah. Anyway, this is fun. I meant to do more of it before this morning, but um, I'll work on it a bit and then show you again how it's going. I still have about three and a half inches left. I didn't even come close to making it to the rendition show. Um, yes, okay, so a couple um, other questions. Yes, Kate, that's true. You could totally take the shedding bar off the Mirex and weave up higher, just picking the shed. For sure, you could weave, if you did that, you could weave almost the entire warp. Um, um, ridging is what happens when every other warp comes forward. So you'll see it a lot on the, I see it a lot on the edges of, um, especially beginner's tapestries. Um, if the weft is pulled tightly in one shed but not the other, that tighter warp forces every other warp thread to come forward. So you get this over under, you know, the every other warp po pokes forward. So you'll see on the edge every other warp sticking out. That's what ridging is. There's a lot of causes for it. I talk about it a lot in the um, warp and weft class. Oh, Mary, of course. Yeah, that I was just assuming. Mary is saying, can you roll the warp to get more room? Absolutely. Um, this, I will actually roll this around soon. So you can weave around most of the Mirex loom. Um, it's just that there's a portion of the warp of 10 to 12 inches that I don't ever use. Um, yeah, and whoever asked that original question, I think, I just assumed that they were rolling it around the back. Um, Oh, and so on the ridging question, Morris, um, no, it almost never has to do with a warp um, being too tight. Does ridging caused by the warp being too tight? I mean, maybe, but because the Mirex, you can have a super, super tight warp. But um, I guess that could contribute. But really, it's not anything about the warp. It's about the weft. It's weft tension, all about weft tension. If you don't know what I mean by weft tension, search my YouTube channel for weft tension. And there's a couple videos. There's at least one video I did for the ATA um, blog tour about weft tension. So it has to do with pulling one pick tighter and one pick being looser. And the shedding bar on any loom, the shedding mechanism can encourage that to happen depending on how the shedding works. Um, and John, you're right. The extenders can help with the shed. So um, I actually like I like six inch warp extenders on the smaller Mirex looms and I use them quite often, especially on the little guy loom because it gives me more warp length and I am not, I don't have a problem with wasting warp. I'd rather have a nice warp to weave on and have enough space for my shed. So the piece can go all the way around the back of the loom, but I want most of the warp on the front of the loom to be free for my shed. But warp extenders can definitely help. Um, that's just extending the um, threaded rod here on the edge of the loom. Oh, that's interesting, Marsha. I didn't know that. So I've never studied with Maximo Laura, but Laura, he's the Peruvian weaver who does the really colorful um, weavings, and he did one of the ATA retreats not not that long ago, I don't think. Anyway, Marsha says, uh, Marsha Ellis says, Maximo Laura uses two to four warps per heddle all the time. 
So that's cool. I would love to know whether, um, does he do that thing where he's sticking the weft between the, um, actually that explains a lot. I bet that's part of how he gets all those different sets in there. That's cool, Marsha. Thank you. Um, yeah, a lot of people do that, Linda. Um, sometimes I do it. Just pick your shed, even on Amerix when you have a shedding bar. If you're working up in shapes, um, like this with this little foot, I'm not using the shedding. I'm just picking the shed, and sometimes that's faster. Yes, Kate, actually, um, that is true. I think that Sarah shows that somewhere in the fringeless class, but um, Kate's asking that given the fringeless warp is already doubled, could you weave on two sets? And yes, definitely. That is very fun to do. When you get towards the top of top or bottom, well, I guess the bottom would work fine, but at the top of a fringeless piece where you're getting close to where those loops connect, it's pretty hard to do, but um, other places in the piece you can definitely war um, weave. You have to pick the shed, but you can split the warp. <laughs> Thanks, Donald. Yeah, Eva, um, again, on the warping bar for the Mirax, I s usually stop. You can't see this, but I stop the warping bar at the top of the loom. You could actually take the top spring out and bring it down a little bit, especially if you took the shedding device off. You could take the shedding device off take the top spring out. You could keep rotating it so that you were weaving in that space that was left. Um, I usually stop the warping bar at the top of the loom though, because I want to keep using the shedding device and I'm willing to waste some warp. Oh yeah, Sheila, sorry. So in the warp and weft class, I talked about this join and I called it the Jenny Hansen join, which if you've taken a class from Joan Baxter, you've probably heard that. She's who taught it to me. Jenny Hansen's an amazing tapestry weaver in, I think she's somewhere in the UK. Um, you should look her up. Uh, her work is gorgeous and she uses this join where you use this thread join and I called it the Jenny Hansen in the warp and weft class. And then I noticed that there are actually other people using this join and um, at the bar join seemed like a better name for it, which is what Kathy Todd Hooker calls it. Um, I don't really know if there's a, I haven't seen it in a book like, I've only seen it in Kathy Todd Hooker's book and John Baxter showed it to me, but um, it may exist somewhere else. Actually, it will be in my book. So um, we'll see what happens with that. Welcome, Eric. Um, oh, Ellen, I have trouble seeing where the turn for the cutbacks goes. Do you have a trick for this? I, in my mind, I have to remember that I'm doing the cutbacks, but I agree, Ellen, that it can be hard. So she's saying that she, for, you know, she's not seeing where it is. Usually as I'm weaving, I push this up so I can see where the last one was. Um, and then I just watch for it, but there are times where I miss it. So I don't have a better trick. Um, and I don't know the pin trick for ridging. That sounds cool. Oh yeah, true. So the wasted seam twine is not wasted, the warp. You can use it for tying up other warps and skeins and such, which is a great use for it because Actually, I should use it for that for dyeing because it won't, um, it's cotton and it won't take the dye that I use for wool. So if I use the thrums, the leftover warp is called thrums, which I think is where the name of thrums publishing comes from. Um, you can use that to tie skeins. That's a great idea, Kate, thanks. Um, yes, Marilyn, um, back to Maximo Laura, a form of double weave that way. So. Go look at Maximo Laura's website, L-A-U-R-A. I think it's just Maximo, L-A-U-R-A dot com. Um, if you've never seen his work, it's really fun. And look carefully at the sets. So he's changing, he's doing like um, double weave kind of stuff, basket weave, all kinds of wrapped techniques. Uh, it's pretty cool. And some of you have studied with him. You can go to Peru and stay with him for three weeks and 
um, learn how he does all of that. So uh, if you're able to go and do that, I think it would be a fascinating uh, three weeks. Start studying your Spanish now, although I think a lot of his um, staff, and I'm sure he speaks good English, and I think a lot of his staff speak English too, but start practicing your Spanish. Um, Mandy, that's a great question. Um, do I have any courses on dyeing yarn? So if you saw my projected course creation list, you would see that a course on dyeing acid wool dye, um, dyeing yarn with acid wool dyes. I probably, it may be a long time before I ever would teach natural dyeing. And there are many, many people who do a fabulous job with natural dyeing. So I will leave it to them. Um, I do the much simpler um, synthetic dyeing, and I am going to be doing a class on that. I hope this year, but um, I said that last year too, so that is my goal. Um, that it will be fairly short, but um, just give the basic stuff about how to do what I've learned over the years about acid wool dyeing. Oh, that's cool. Mary says, thrums are any piece of fiber often used to pack between knit stitches to make super warm mittens. Thrums felt with use. I just remember my grandma talking about thrums. So my grandma was a weaver and she had in her studio a board. It probably, I think it was like an old pegboard that you'd put thread on and it was just covered with the ends of the warps that she'd cut off and they were all different colors. They were all just hanging there. I think she used them for embroidery eventually, but um, she called them thrums, and that's where I remember the word thrums from. But apparently it has a wider use than I am familiar with. Um, that I don't know, Jessica. She's asking about a Borgs um, warp. If Borgs makes it, I believe they're in Sweden, and it's cotton. Is it cotton? Um I don't know, but it sounds interesting. I'd love to see it. Oh, if you want to go to Cusco, Maximo has a um, workshop rescheduled for October. It was supposed to be next week. I, it was you who told me that, Lynn. I'm sorry that you are not in Peru right now, but um, hopefully it will happen. Uh, yes, um, Shari. Using the loom extenders on my Merrick's Big Sister, I have some loom stability issues. Yes, you should. If you got the extenders from Merrick's, they should have come with longer feet. So there's these extenders that go on the feet of the loom that make it much more stable. It actually helps a lot. If you didn't get the extenders from Merrick's, if you just bought threaded rod at the hardware store, figure out a way to make the feet longer, like maybe some PVC pipe that fits over it or... Um, um, yeah, there's probably many, many ways you could extend the feet, but if those feet are longer, the loom is much stabler. And I like the six inch extenders better than the 12 because the 12 inches are so tall that you have to reach really high to change your shed. And that's hard on your shoulder. So I really, I prefer the six inch ones. And Mirex sells those under the 22 inch loom or maybe on the accessories page. Anyway, they do have six inch extenders that come with those little foot um, foot extenders also. Oh, thank you, Evelyn. Um, sign twine in Sweden is called Matvarp. I'm probably saying that wrong, but that is super helpful. Um, you guys, it's been really fun to chat with you today. Um, Oh, that's great. Jessica's going to post a picture of the label. So I'll look for it and I'll put it on my, on that page on my website, which is right there, that Change the Shed page. So I said at the beginning, if you missed it, this page, um, hopefully you can see that and I'm not just like pointing to the ceiling, um, RebeccaMezoff.com, Change the Shed. Um, I'm putting links for stuff that we talked about, like if you want to know where to get a loom or I talked about some company or whatever. Um, if I remember, I, I'll put a link there. So I'll put Jessica's picture up there too. Um, yes. Donald, I could go on and on. I will go on and on another day about the warp extender on the Harrisville rug loom because it is magic. 
Um, you all, it is so fun to talk to you that I could just keep going, but I will um, see what comes up tomorrow. Do some weaving and um, have a good Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, if you need a reminder. Tuesday. Um, and I'll, I'll catch you tomorrow and we will do some more weaving on something. 